right, I'm going to start with uh, vectors and fields this week. Um, I think I explained uh, previously that at any point anywhere in space is a vector by it's, it's a point and it's a vector depending on what you what kind of component you plug it into and the uh, XYZ coordinate will just be um, kind of associated with an origin point and then the distance uh, magnitude uh, between those two will be your magnitude of your vector and, and also set sort of the direction. And that means if you take that vector and apply an extrusion to let's say this blue shape here it will uh, extrude to that direction and this sort of vector can be moved around uh, translated from anywhere to anywhere else. A two-point vector, um, in this case, starting with ABC and going towards XYZ, is a different way to create a vector. And for that, you just need two points as an input. And then that would extrude it that direction. And you can also reverse a vector and make it go in the opposite direction of the same magnitude. And that's another option. Adding vectors, we're not going to do too much, but um, it kind of works like a parallelogram that uh, if these were your two vectors on the same point, uh, adding the two vectors, it just basically moves this vertical vector to this position and adding them, if it was a triangle, the addition of the two vectors is the hypotenuse. And uh, in, in the case of a parallelogram, it's kind of a diagonal uh, when these two form the sides. So if we take a curve and uh, were to divide the curve or evaluate the curve, which we kind of did in previous weeks, that will uh, create a number of points on the curve. And in the output section, there is the points that we've used already, but there's also the normal of the curve, which is a vector. And there's the points on the curve. So the, nor the, the normals will sort of go along um, the curve. And in this case, they're really, really small. Um, uh, this kind of geometry overlapping here. So it's not actually a vector from the point to the point. These are little tiny vectors, but the R is still big. So if I multiply them up, you kind of see that they're kind of coming off um, tangent to the curve at, at all these different points. And then they can be rotated to 90 degrees if you wanted to uh, use them that way. When you evaluate or divide a surface and find points on the surface, U being one dimension and V being the other direction. So you find your UV coordinates, which are points on the surface, and then take their normal, and they are sort of offsetting from the surface. And if you were to offset a surface, it would just use these normals. Um, they get kind of used in background information a lot. One nice project, um, this is about 10 years ago, or maybe more, um, by Jose Sanchez, who's a professor of architecture at University of Michigan. And this was, I think, his master's thesis or something he did when he was a student. And it was just this kind of rising geometry and taking all these uh, normals off the curves. And then using the point on the curve, the end point of the vector, and then mirroring that curve and then going to the end point of this vector and then back to the point on this curve and using that to form a nerves curve and connecting them all together forms the kind of stair-like shape where if you move the geometry upward, you get more openings in this. And, and he did a lot of this in wood and, and kind of did openings in wood as you would bend kind of sheet material. And on the opposite side, you kind of see that the it's still the, the start point to the end of the vector point to the next vector point to the back to the sort of end point. So in this case, the curve is reversed. Last time we were looking at the side now it's on the other side. And he, uh, Jose Sanchez has um, many lectures online, both on Grasshopper and which are all 10 years old, but they're still very much relevant and the, the basic introduction and Python and Maya and other sort of uh, cool geometry stuff. But he has this as part of one of his uh, lectures that I watched a long time ago. 
And this is by Christoph Krola, a Dragon Skin Pavilion. And you kind of see from stuff we've done in previous weeks, as well as uh, surface normals, how this uh, might have been drawn in Grasshopper or something uh, like it. I'm going to share uh, a file, and I'll show you um, a file um, in Grasshopper in a second. But this is uh, a tree using an L system that basically just uses uh, a vertical line and a line at an angle where we alter that angle. And then just repeats those two lines on the end of it, shrinking it each time, and comes out like uh, a tree-like shape. And when we adjust the length of the line and the angle, we get very different types of tree shapes uh, using kind of L system logic. A blog that's uh, got a bunch of grasshopper definitions. Again, ten years old, um, but um, most of it still works. When you use any file that's sort of from a previous edition of Grasshopper, sometimes the components need to be updated because they've changed how they work. And it just says this component doesn't work anymore and you just need to replace it and rewrite the definition all over a bit. But um, generallandscapes.wordpress.com and it's got a lot of um, vector stuff, fields, agents, uh, recursive geometry, and how that works in Grasshopper. A lot of it requires plugins but it works pretty well. And these are attractor points, which is gonna be our, our first example. We're not gonna do one as complicated as this, but attractor point is just uh, controlling geometry using the distance of a bunch of shapes to a point or to a line or to a bunch of points and letting uh, the numbers of the distance control the geometry. So it kind of changes a vector or changes something. And Kind of creates these gradient effects of geometry and you can use attractor points in a number of different ways like you could say a star shape with the number of points on the star um, relative to the distance from a point and you sort of have a triangle and, and a star shape and then as you get closer to the point you might have or as you get further away from the point you might have like a 10 or 12 or 50 sided star uh, and ModeLab is another um, website online that produced a, a PDF primer on Grasshopper that's uh, quite comprehensive on those things. And then they have an online version of that now as well. So one command we're going to use that is kind of like the surface morph command, but um, different is orient direction. It's uh, in a way surface morph is more complicated, but we basically have any shape, have a vector, and then we have a different vector and it sort of just moves the shape to that vector, changes the direction, changes the scale, changes, um, I guess, rotates it in the direction. And it does that all at once just using a vector. Um, it doesn't um, skew the geometry in terms of like a isosceles triangle will still be an isosceles triangle and a collateral triangle will still be um, the same. Then we're going to look at um, kind of just moving geometry uh, using vectors. And this is kind of an example of something on a, on a building board. We're just going to look at it in a two dimensional uh, view. Uh, the way these kind of lines bend around uh, points. In this case, they have trees coming through the building, but we're just going to create points and ask the geometry to bend around the points. And we can put the points anywhere. We can uh, change the strength of the points, the attraction of the points, and that will be our second example. And it will kind of, I, I just remi reminded me of the album cover by Peter Sauer for Joy Division, um, kind of reminded me of this album cover, and uh, maybe if you want later you can look at creating a grasshopper version of this album cover with sort of um, new abilities in it. And then last, we're going to look at fields, which uh, a nice example is this BioThings Cerusi Pavilion. And it's, look at that. that one's kind of more complicated. We'll do a simpler version of this. So, um, so this is um, the tree that I was mentioning. And we have. Uh, sliders at the beginning to change the initial angle. And you can see, if I move this, 
kind of change it from different species of tree. And that's using the angle and the orient direction uh, command. We're not going to do this. And I just opened this file that I did. This is kind of an example of things that are on generative landscapes. Um, the pick and choose command component is not one we've done, but it's sort of um, just, you, you can sort of click plus down here at the bottom and give it as many choices as it wants, and it will output one choice. So. one of these and uh, we can sort of alter the randomness and see what's changing there. But there's lots of cool stuff on the blog. Um, okay. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is just an attractive point. And attractive points are kind of the stereotype of grasshopper geometry. Um, some people don't want it. ways. Um, we're going to do the simplest one uh, just for example. So if we start off with a square grid or rectangular grid, um, there's a good square grid, and um, we do 100 points here. Standard is 10, so I'm fine with 10 squares, but 10 squares with 100 um, the size of each square on both sides. And then I want to create some geometry on the points of every part of that grid, so I can use the polygon command. And if I want to create a triangle, this is how I do it, but I just need to or this is the easiest way to do it. Um, so the number of sides, which is I, can, I set to three, the triangle, and I need a radius. Uh, I'm going to put a slider between um, zero and 20, can't be zero. But, yeah. And Uh, there should be points. Yes, okay. So on the points of the square grid, um, I'm going to put a polygon, radius 20, uh, segments 3. And then I want to find a vector on those shapes, the original shape. So if I use the area command, that's nice because it gives me the C, which is centroid for the center of that shape. And I want one of the points on the curve to attach onto. So list item, or sorry, control points first. And then list item to give me any, just one of those control points on every shape. And our first vector, two point vector, It's going to be from, let's say, from the centroid to the point. And then uh, we can create a point anywhere, which is going to be our attractor point. And I'm going to do set one point, right click set one point, and then just click left click in line up, and that's there. And if I kind of Click this, I can move this in Rhino, even though it's, it's sort of moving in Grasshopper because in this way of doing it is it's a safe point in the Grasshopper file. I can still move it around. 
And I want to create a vector uh, two points. And this vector wants to be from uh, points on the square to the point. And Orient direction. So we have got this orient direction uh, component, which is our sort of main component of this. And we're going to put the polygon geometry into the geometry. That's the one we're going to um, orient. And our vector on that geometry is our direction for A, our point for A. Is going to be centered. And we want to put a multiplier between these two or an amplitude um, so that we can sort of scale it any way we want, which is probably going to be quite small. So let's do zero point zero. So it's a slider between zero and one. There and we still need a point. We can the same point before. Okay. Uh, but they want zero. Oh. So um, let me turn off a lot of this geometry because it's kind of getting in the way. So um, I've got this geometry repeating here, and um, kind of just need to flatten some parts. Yeah. Okay. So they need to be flattened on the top vector two point in order for this to work properly. And I'm going to turn off the grid as well. And that's fine at 0 0.18. And now if I move this point, that geometry in real time should sort of change the direction of all the triangles to uh, sort of face its direction and um, change the scale of them so that the ones nearest the point are moving to the smaller. And if I wanted, I could create an extra part of a line um, so I could see the rotation better, a line between the center and one of those points. Um, I'll just create that, but you guys can start um, that. I don't know if people missed parts if I cut out, but you can ask any questions. But this is a, a very simple tractor. And ask any questions as you guys do it. Does that make sense for anyone there? James, what's the square you're using there at the beginning of the left side? The square is a square grid. And uh, if you type square, it's this one with um, kind of the black lines extending beyond the square. You could create a rectangular grid or any kind of grid which is in vector grid square. But it's just a way of getting a bunch of points pretty fast. And I just left the uh, extents, which is the number of grid cells, as, as five, which is the default of that was 10. So it's five by five. And I just set the size as 100. And I, the 
plane is default set to the origin point, and I didn't bother changing that, so I just left that as the default as well. Any help needed? On that uh, lower vector two point, uh, what is the B coming from? The lower vector two point. Oh, so that's a point, and you can just create a point and then right click set one point and set the one point anywhere. Yeah, I, I think I'm about where you are too. Um, my polygons seem to be hexagons, as it were. Um, oh, so you, you know the, the S on the polygon is the number of segments. Okay. So that's either three if you want a triangle, six if you want a hex. Default is six, which is why it's six. I see. And uh, I mean, if you made that a slider, you could. Yeah, for sure. You know, between zero and 10, or not zero, but you would need a minimum of three for a triangle. Um, oh, cool. But maybe between three and 10, you'd be able to. Switch. Yeah, that's good. Above 10, you just start getting at the circle. <laughs> um, okay, Thanks. so that's our basis of that. 
if we were to use multiple points, which I'm not going to draw here, but um, we can do multiple points and then just say take the um, the largest value or the smallest value, depending on which way you want it to work. And therefore, by the largest value, it will sort of work with the nearest point. And therefore, you can have 10 points on a larger grid, or you can do a line and, and have the closest point to the line as the distance that you're going to set for the vector. You can do different things by the way. So I'm going to turn this all and now we're going to do the the kind of lines that um, kind of similar but from different. So if I start with two series, this is just a different way of creating a series of lines. There's so many different ways, and I want sliders that slide to 100 or So that's basically a uh, hundred steps on the series, and every single number is going to step by a hundred. I guess I could do this more. And then I want to create x, y, z point, construct point, okay. and I'm going to construct x and y, and in a previous one, I have less points actually. Uh, so if I graphed one of these, but not both of them, I get a grid of points. And depending on which one I graphed, uh, depends whether the path is vertical or horizontal. Um, so if I do a nerds curve to connect these points, I can see that I have horizontal curves. And if I graph both of them, that's not going to work. Because it's uh, and there are vertical lines. So I'm going to go back to graphing Y which gives me all the Y points that sort of own path and um, get these nerves curves. And then I want to find, um, this time I'm going to use several points. And I still just use the same point container, but rather than do set one point, I do set multiple points. And I'm going to just create Bunch of points. I'm going to expand the point grid into this area. So all those points, the green points are my points. And um, let's extend on the x number of points. And extend. Okay, so now I want a two point vector between all of these points, actually that, I want the closest point. So cloud of points to search from is going to be C, and the point to search from is P. And um, this number is going to be kind of uh, big, most likely. Um, so I'm going to divide it by three. So well, I'll do some math in a, in a second when I get back to it. But um, we're going to create a vector, two-point two vector between whatever the closest point is and all of these points. Let's see if that would have been great. 
So I'm creating a subtraction component and I'm going to do a 100 point slider. I'm going to put the 100 into the A and this number into the B. And that means or whatever these distances are, they're going to be subtracted from whatever this is. And I'll, I'll explain the math in a second. But, and then I also want the maximum between whatever this number is and zero. And that just means any number which was below zero will be deleted. So it's either zero or this number if this number is bigger than zero. So now we can use amplitude or multiply, it doesn't matter. We can multiply groups. And vector display. And see how big these vectors are. It's going to go in there and yeah. it's all these original points. All right, so those green lines are our vectors. And I'm going to turn these points off in the way. So they're going the wrong way compared to the direction I want them to go. I want them to go kind of outward from the points. So let's reverse vector, which is this reverse with the two lines. And put that into the All right. And use a small vector, let's do between zero and five. Just kind of in here. So this is just making the number smaller. This is saying, setting our, our sort of maximum there. So you see how that's controlling that visually. So that's kind of the maximum number. And then it's just going to subtract whatever the numbers coming out of this distance are. And then delete all the ones that are smaller than zero, which is these ones in the sort of gaps here. And yeah, so those vectors look kind of good. So now we're going to move those points from the original using the vectors and then recreate the lines with the moved points. So um, we want the original points from the beginning, which we have turned off. That one. And let's just turn it off for a second. Um, the vector is just going to be this one. So the points are basically being moved away by the uh, direction and magnitude of the vectors from the points that we uh, put into the model. And then uh, a NURBS curve to link those points together. And if we turn off the NURBS geometry in the way, I kind of like how it looks with the um, vector display on, but that's kind of what we're aiming for. And the original lines must be on as well. And then if we play with these numbers, we'll see the geometry kind of changing a bit. Might do this one as um, zero plus than three point five five plus than five. That's just two decimal points. Is more control. Okay. And that's kind of what we want to create as our second example. If we were to change right back at the beginning, the density, we get more lines. So 
All right, so any questions on that? Yeah, it kind of constrained me to an axis and the sort of it's it's like a block diagram. <laughs> oh, when you were drawing the points in in Rhino, they were constrained to sort of orthogonal ninety degrees. Yeah, I was drawing them in the the top view. Um, yes, it was. Okay, so it, it doesn't matter with the top view. Basically, that what's happening there is uh, in Rhino as opposed to in Grasshopper. There, um, I've got too much stuff on my screen to see, and I can't see with this. Um, I can't see the bottom of my grasshopper, but there's basically ortho there, and you can turn right. ortho on and off. And alternatively, uh, it's F8, and if you're on a laptop, you need the function key on, but F8 is to turn ortho on and off, and that will lock you to the ortho sort of top, bottom, horizontal, yeah. or just give you more of a free form. So if you want to reset them with F8 um, toggles, and that should stop that problem. Cool. So were you doing it when I like at the same time as when I was doing it? Um yeah, yeah, thereabouts. Um I, I went back and created a couple different point primitives um with a couple different points just to see it change as I was um the the rest seems to be um at least reasonably close. Yeah, I mean, one thing that might be maybe even more interesting. Um, some sort of a gridlock or something. Since I have time, I'll just do, if I do a, let's say, bounding rectangle around all these points. Yeah. Okay, and then I Populate to the to the bounding rectangle, and then create a slider. Let's say so let's do twenty point slider zero uh, less than twenty, and the number of points to be and then C. 100 point slider for the seed, just, just to randomize it. Okay. And then let's switch these points for the points that we have. And now the seed will randomize out of the pattern. That's another way of doing it. Just, okay. And when once you get this as curved geometry, you could do a surface morph and bring it on to, from a building perspective, bring it onto a facade or use a technique that we're going to do in the next example where we sort of divide these curves and then give them a height that's sort of only the parts that are um, these kind of eye shapes. So it sort of has this bumpy facade. Okay. So are both of you caught up or? Yeah, basically. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to move on then and turn this off. I'm just working in the same model the whole time. The same grass up the cloud. And now we're going to do fields. And 
they're kind of related to vectors in a sense. And I'm going to start with just a number of points and um, I'll create another ellipse. To start off, I can just create any shape. Um, and I want to divide the curve. And I want the, the top E into curve, so dividing the ellipse. And because the geometry in this is going to get kind of complex, I'm going to deal with a low number of points. So I have, let's say, five initial points in kind of a pentagon shape that are just division points on the ellipse. And I could just manually paint these five points. It doesn't really matter. But one way of doing it. And to create fields, you basically need charges and uh, you can merge the power of the field together uh, and then create field lines. So there's a few separate components that sort of stitch together to do it. So I'm just going to create the point charge and then do the control alt that shows that the field commands are in vector and field. So you see the menu, it's got line charge, point charge, spin force, vector force, uh, merge fields, important one field line, important one. And um, they're the main ones we're going to use. So we just created the point charge and um, start with that. So on each one of these points, we're going to create a point charge. And you kind of see it has this sort of uh, symbol. And I'm going to use very low numbers for each of these um, charges. Um, you can do sliders between zero and five, set to one. So C is the charge of the point. And D is the decay. And then um, I also need some points or geometry that are going to be essentially dragged or swept along the sort of field that we create. So a different sort of line, I'm going to create circles on each of these um, curves. And I can give uh, a radius to the circle. I should probably create these kind of quite small. And then I need to divide those points because I'm, I'm looking for points. I'll explain this in a second. And then, um, okay, so I'm just going to look at the minus space here. So I've got five points that I could have created just randomly. And I put point charges on each of the five points, created circles around each of the points, and then had a, a bunch of points around that. And I'm basically going to ask these points to be dragged into lines um, based on the magnetic forces of the field that we're creating. So now we do field line, which is kind of like creating a nerves curve. It's It's the actual curve geometry. And before I create um, the F, the, the force connect the, the two Fs, I need to merge the uh, fields. And that's because we have uh, five fields, which are these five um, point charges. And if I did uh, line uh, charges or spin forces, they're just other fields. And I need to merge them at the end so that they um, what do you call it? They sort of add together and have a sort of compounding force. So there's our, our field. And then um, 
P is a point and samples. A is accuracy. So I'm going to leave a few of these uh, alone and And now you kind of see how these lines are kind of connecting and blending into each other. So this number 20 is the number of points on these circles, which is the number of points being dragged in a line. And if I make that 30, that's 30 on every single one of those circles and 40. You're gonna see how that's working. And If I was to change this radius to 10, it would just leave this blank space in, in the middle of each circle, um, which I don't need to do that. And if I change this, it's the number of these circles, because that's the division points on this ellipse, so and I'll change that later. So I guess if you get that far, just to make sure we get the components in the right place, or are you already that far? Really cool, yeah. I see about the same. Okay, so we got about the same. So that is if I get away from the top view and onto the perspective view, this is currently completely flat. It's it's on the ground. And let me change it to ghosted. And so okay. So we're gonna do it a different way because we got the time of creating height on this. So I want to, so each one of these are curves, like that's the output, they're, they're just nerve strips. And we have um, five groups of 40 in each group, or in, in, in each panel. So every single one of those curves, divide curve, and the default is 10, which is fine, just leave it at 10. So we have all these points and I basically want to lift them up on the Z axis, but um, I don't want to lift them up all the same amount. I kind of want a range of values so that they kind of create a, a, an arc as such or a, a kind of vault. And I'm going to use Graph Mapper, which was in one of the definitions that was available to download in the previous week, but I haven't really explained it. And this is just where I can create sine curves or conic curves or any kind of curves. And it shifts all the data along these curves and I can just move them really quick. It's, it's a very cool and powerful um, component. And to go into it, I need um, some numbers and then I get some numbers out of it. And I'll just run some of it. So let me put a series of numbers and list length is, if I take um, these um, divisions and I put the points in here, this length will tell me that there are 200 values in the uh, series. And I want a series of numbers the same length. So let's just check that. Yeah, that was that. I have 2,200 points. There's more points than I thought I had, but yeah, that's right. So I need to, this is by default not set to anything. And I need to right click and give it a graph type, which let's just create um, Bezier for the first time. And then its output 
we want to use the remap command, which I mentioned at the end of last week. And the bounds command, or bounds, um, so that just gives me the domain, whatever this domain is, there. And then construct domain, kind of like the morph or the orient direction, it's sort of shifting from whatever the domain is to whatever this new domain is. It's just kind of scaling up all the numbers. So I don't need to set the minimum because the minimum is zero. And when we have this, this will sort of make all the numbers proportionally bigger. And I also need to connect the graph mapper to the V for the remap numbers. We have 2,200 values. So basically moving this curve is shifting all 2,200 values uh, at once. Okay. So with these divided curves, so this is, these are points. I want to deconstruct the points. And that means for all the points, this is the x value, this is the y value, this is the uh, z value. And then I want to construct the points um, again, and I'm going to keep all the x values, keep all the y values, but the z values are, actually, sorry, I did this wrong. We just want to mess with the z values, which is still a list of 2200 values. So um, that's, now that makes more sense. And then the remap numbers are going in there. Okay, so I'm just going to create a bounding box and do it. Uh, and flatten anything coming into it. Take it. The reason I'm doing this is just so I can zoom on the selected object so that my line out is orbiting around the right area. Okay, so let's turn off. And turn off these lines as well. And let, let me just go ahead and create nerves with these points. And then I'll turn the points off and then I'll try to figure out. Yeah, okay, that's actually what I think. All right, so the points in each line are being moved in the z-axis by this graph type. So if I do a sign and I grab this point here, see that everything can move very quickly. And if you sort of, kind of takes a while to get used to, but you kind of drag So there's kind of a sign curve in the z-axis. And then with this uh, geometry at the very end, uh, we want to do something super simple. Just create a unit z value and an extrude. And extrude these curves by a unit z value. I kind of alternate between Z and Z because one's European one American. Um, this is probably going to be a small number. Not going to be zero though. Let's see. Yeah. So there's our kind of I can't remember our name. There's one um, 
chef on Instagram who created silicon molds for desserts. And one of them kind of looks like this. And I really like full custom geometry. I mean, very much uses, I think she uses Grasshopper and creates these kind of funky silicon molds. So that's most of this example. And then if we go back to the beginning, and that's the one. Go back to the beginning and change our division points to maybe eight. And my computer is slowed down, but yeah, it's still working out. And maybe we want the z axis to be a little higher. So the domain is the sort of maximum. If, if this graph mapper is distorting all of the values, but towards sort of projecting them onto the curve, whatever's here, the domain here at the end, when we remap the output of the graph mapper, is the maximum value. So this is stretching the maximum value of the z axis. All right, so does that make sense to everyone? So uh, James, I have the uh, general shape there, but for some reason, all of my ellipses are kind of just stacked on top of each other. Oh. Um... You've got the general shape. Um, when you say all the ellipses are stacked, um, you want to share screen? Yeah. All right, so something went wrong somewhere. There we go. Um, let's just um, can I zoom in on the grasshopper and I think something was goofed back here. All right, let's just turn off the uh, lofted surfaces or the extruded surfaces. I think uh, let's go back a few steps and let's just turn off all the geometry until we get to a point that we know is correct. So let's turn off the nerves and the points that are in this screen currently. And let's just have a look at the field in two dimensions. Uh... An easy way to switch the view. But I'm going to do that. Now, I think, I think by the way, that was in the top view, but you rotated the top view. So by right clicking and going to the top view, it kind of goes back to the default top view. Um, okay, so I can see your forces on your ellipse, which is super small at the center. And uh, what are the dimensions of that just on your grasshopper file? So um, um, if we make that bigger, it might just scale everything, but let's make that um, bigger, way bigger, like, a, like just whatever the maximum on that slider is. Okay, I see now. Uh, uh, let's just make them 100, like let's go all the way, change, change the slider. Probably easier just to create new sliders, but you can change them manually right clicking values, but it's easier to create. And I think I said before on dimensions that it's not so important what the dimensions are, just that everything in the model is proportional to other things in the model. All right, so this is looking a little better already. Um, so you got your ellipse, you got it divided seven times, which is fine. Uh, R1 and R2 are the same, so that means it's a circle, which is fine. Uh, point charge is fine. Um, your decay is higher than mine. It, it's not going to make a ton of difference. Uh, circle is 10. Uh, divide. So that divide on that circle there is six. That's why you kind of have these uh, six-sided spider shapes, as opposed to something, you know, basically, if you turn that up, there's your, your field going. So the field is created. Um, 
just note on some of the stuff, um, I don't know how fast your graphics card is, but um, if you are to do some super complicated stuff with fields, the it can slow down your computer because it can get quite busy. So um, got the divide. So in 2D, this is looking way better now. Um, let's turn off all that geometry and uh, then focus on the getting height on the model. You're talking about like the ellipse and the points, all this. Yeah, all that stuff can go off. Man. I mean, it's all right, so. Um, and the reason it's circular is because on the ellipse, if R1 or R2 are equal, it's a circle and the circle. Right. Well, what, are, what is uh, the, these red points? What, What's driving that? Is that the oh? So the the red points are well. The point charges are on, which are just those things at the center. Uh, merge forces is is just repeating the things at the center as well. The field lines are the nerves curves connecting those points. The divide curves uh, is those points probably because we, we you remember we're dividing the field lines. The the divide after that is probably those points. Right. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. So there's our kind of 2D geometry perfectly. Okay, so then we've got deconstruct and then, okay, this is where I said it wrong at first, but then I, I corrected myself afterwards. The list length and the data we're taking is actually the Z axis data. See when we deconstruct the point. Right. So the Z axis into the length, list length. Currently the, the divide. So basically what we're doing is saying the X and Y are the complete same remain in the exact same position, but the z-axis, we're going to shift you along this graph mapper curve and then remap it to the height of 70 and then go back into the z-axis. So um, that's all fine, it's fine. Uh, 70, 70, Okay, so um, if we get out of the top view so we can see what this looks like. Um, there you go. Okay, so currently it's turned off. Um, let's turn off the, the nerves curves or the, the field lines from the other, from the left side of the thing. And you can turn off the merge fields, which is just those. Well, I guess that's the, the component to the left on as well. But anyway, they're, none of them are that, they're not messing up our view. So um, if you just turn off NURBS curves, the final NURBS curves, hopefully this is right. Yeah, there we go. And then the extrusion, we can turn it on as well. So when you had your geometry super small, like three and four, if you had to have an extrusion of four at the end, that would have been a massive extrusion relative to the overall size of your model. You know, so just everything needs to be proportional to everything else. And then, um, is Matt done or Matt, are you done as well? So when you open things on Grasshopper, it takes a while for them to open in the first place, but once they're open, they're open. And now they should be fine, yeah. Okay, so this is just a more busy version. You can see my screen. And on this, it's mostly the same, right? Just when it comes to forces, there's a point charge, there's a field spin, which is just rotation uh, around, and that's it. I thought I had a line chart as well. Maybe I don't. Yeah. And I have a lot more geometry to begin with. You kind of, that's what I made the GIF from in the Hackaday page. And this file is already on the Hackaday page for download. And yeah, other than that, everything else is there. 
Yeah, I got to say the uh, the parallels to the physics uh, is is really cool. It's really wild. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fun. Um, and then what files do I have open as well? So basic extractor, we did that. That's the second example. Yeah, that's most of what I wanted to cover today. I guess we're done fairly well. Um, yeah, there's, 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 um, I noticed uh, Arthur Mary Many, who I mentioned in a previous lecture, who did the Burning Man project, and he teaches um, kind of full time, but not full time, sort of does his practice and his teaching. And uh, one of his students did a really cool project that I, he, he posts a lot to Instagram. And one of his students did a very cool project using fields that sort of stitched them all together. So we're checking out. Maybe I'll post something in the aggregation. But yeah, that's it. Is there any questions about fields or vectors or? I know I've got plenty to sort of uh, toy around with. Uh... I know once my uh, computer finishes loading the advanced uh, advanced file. <laughs> yeah, so it, it, it's, it's basically anytime you move a number, so even in the advanced file, that if you move any parameter, it will take that same amount of time to reload. Um, but once it's loaded, then you can kind of orbit and rotate around it yeah. without having any um, lag in load time. And also, just actually quite an important thing if, if you guys are to do more complicated projects. So, um, if you see my, you guys can see my screen, right? Yeah. So, there's um, up here at the top, file, edit, view, display, solution, help. So, um, a lot of time when I do vector display, by the way, I put the hidden lines on, um, which is just wire display hidden and faint. Um, and hidden basically makes this wireless. I think I might explained it before. And faint makes little lines. And cool. but then as well up here from display in uh, Canvas widgets and profiler. And the profiler puts a little tab underneath every component saying how many uh, seconds it's taking to calculate. Um, and you can see this field line is red at 2.5 M. And all the other ones are kind of quick, right? So if you were doing a model and you wanted to um, create a gap here or something, right? You can put in a, a data down. Right? There's, there's a few different ways of doing this, right? But um, Oh, this is going to recalculate, but imagine I don't want to recalculate this model here on the left. But if I put these sliders in here and then connected that one in there, right? And that means any sliders I adjust this side of the data dam, none of that data is being passed through the dam until I click the play button. If that makes sense. And that basically, if there's a whole load of geometry down the line, and you don't want that to recalculate every time you make a change at the beginning, you can put in data dams and say, only let the data go flow through to the end when I tell you to do so. And just since we're kind of doing this stuff and there's still time left, um, also kind of useful to know about is, um, Oh, I forget the name. Uh, string. I'm just going to create a little mini example here. So, or let me do this in a different model that's not. So this is, um, okay, so stream filter. And um, what should I do? Um, I'm just going to 
create a point or create an origin point and create a point on 100, 0. And then I'm just creating the most basic geometry just for the sake of having something to plug into this thing. All right, so there is a line. This is not the most interesting example I ever come up with, but it just explains. Maybe I'll change it in a second. Oh. So if I have two options here of two um, pre-worked um, rows, and I put option one into the zero and option one into the one, and if I wanted more options, I just add them here, and then this G is the sort of pattern I need. And if I create a, a sort of a drop down value list, okay. So let's put that in there. Okay. So it kind of gives this kind of almost coding like interface that is um, default sort of set wrongly. So I have to type zero for the first one and one for the second one, because that's what's down here. And delete these two lines. And I'll just, I, I can keep this. This is just text and it's any text. So one and two is fine, right? And I turn this off. So now I have sort of a drop down menu to choose this option or that option. And sometimes at the beginning, let's say it was the uh, example before, and we were creating an ellipse with five points or just a random set of points using a populate 2D, and we created that filter. And then you just have a drop down menu to sort of say change. And then like sometimes the geometry on the left side of the filter could be hundreds of components. And then we just sort of say change track like a like a train track with change switch. Just something useful. And then there there are other things in here. Most of them aren't that interesting. But yeah we covered actually a bit of it. Yeah, I was just going to mention that. But um, that's most of their, that's kind of this week's lecture on vectors and fields. All right, so any more questions or is this option A, option B thing clear, I guess? Yeah, and that um, the sort of the the dam function to so, sort of hold up a uh, you know heavyweight um heavyweight data uh, really cool yeah a, there's a, a few feature. different ways as well i think with data i mean back to just data dam um if we do the control alt so that's coming from the primitives um and utilities and um there's sort of a trigger as well and there's a few other things here that are I mean, there's also not that I rarely ever use these things, but um, if you wanted a slider that's like a circle or something. And then actually just as well as one last thing that um, this is the basic version of the components in Grasshopper and everything else is searchable. There is um, some way of turning on the more complicated version. Actually, there's one other thing I want to show you, actually, because I was into this week. Um, okay. Are you, you're both still there, right? Okay. So let me go up to a, a proper example of the grid. Okay. 
So if I, I've got a whole bunch of sliders here, some that are relevant and some that are not. And um, in this example here, which is the second example, the number of points in this populate 2D is relevant. So I can go publish to remote panel if I right click on that specific slider. And then the seed is definitely re relevant because that's the randomizer of it. And um, these two down here, I haven't labeled, but um, this is sort of the strength of the forces. So it's, uh, we go right click publish to remote panel. And that's also relevant to the push down to remote panel, even though it's not named. And uh, let's just leave the, them the same, right? So if I open the remote control panel and then I close Grasshopper, then this can sort of just click in to line out the edge here. And so, sort of with big files, I might not want to have the whole file open. And the, the remote panel will save in a Grasshopper file. And it's just all the sliders. And I can um, create new groups. So rename the group, let's say, strength. Um, move these two into the group. So now without having Grasshopper and all the busyness of it, um, I can, oh, sorry, I need to turn off the edit there. And I can now just move the sliders from the sort of remote control panel. Getting this up, but anyway, that's the remote control panel. Useful if you have large files and lots of sliders. Like if you remember that bridge um, file from week one, that, that had a lot of sliders in different sections so we could put like um, bottom part, top part, railing, and have all the sliders there. But yeah, that's just something worth knowing about. All right, I'll leave it at that. So hope that that's enough for this week. And then next week, we're going to look at um, the kind of plugins that are available for Grasshopper and the physics engine, which is a plugin, but is, is a default plugin uh, called Kangaroo, and um, do that. All right, so I'll see you guys next week.